Hey, Cody, it's an honor to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Let's go into a bit of uh, off the cuff questions. Um, if you had to change one rule in the government process, what would that be? Boy, that is off the cuff. That's a hard one to start with. Um, if I could change one rule about the government process. Actually, I think it wouldn't necessarily be about the process. It'd be about the education. I think I would change the the our, our civics lessons to make sure everybody actually understood the way our government worked. Hmm. Interesting. You mean like the primary and the secondary education? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, high school, even college. I, I think... We have too many people who graduate who don't understand how their government works, both for them and sometimes not for them. Yeah, cool. I think that's a good segue into the second question I have for you. So how would you feel like, you know, how would you get the youth to be more involved in government relations? That's a great question. First and foremost, you've got to make it uh, rewarding. You've got to, you've got to see how your contribution actually delivers a process or a, a result. And um, I think far too many people don't understand the pace of government and the fact that it takes a long time to get a lot of things done. And so you, we've got to figure out how to make that process attractive to the young to hold their attention because there are so many other things that are much more um, instant and, and we're an instant gratification society. And it's really hard to think about a three-year project. Hmm. and um how i mean like let's say if you had to define like three skills um with someone who needs who wants to get to be a, get into government relations how would you define those three skills well i think the first obviously is is um communication skills i think you've got to know how not only to talk to people but how to to judge how to talk to the audience in front of you at the time. And it may be different in the next five minutes. So that's number one. I think number two is you, you really have to have analytical skills and understand um, how to decipher different concepts and how to, how to make sure that what you're seeing is actually what you're asking for. Cause that doesn't always happen. I think the third skill is really, um, is really a negotiating skill. Not only communications, but you've got to learn the art of negotiation and how to get to yes, even if sometimes your client doesn't doesn't want to get to that yes, you've got to figure out how to get them there. And how would you develop these three skills? Well, I went to law school, so that's how I developed them. Um, I think for communications, you know, there's there's a lot. To, there's a lot out there. I think first and foremost, just talk to people, um, get to know them, uh, get to know how to read a room, how to uh, how to communicate with others that may not be on the same place that you are. Uh, for your analytical, that's just a matter of study. Uh, you just it's a, a it, you just have to discipline yourself to learn how to read and and respond and analyze. Um, and negotiation, I think, is the same thing. Mm. Um, you can go to school for that. You can become a mediator. You can go to law school. Um, you don't have to, but that's definitely a learned skill. I don't know many people except for my seven-year-old who are good at the art of negotiation. <laughs> and um, how would you educate the public the role of um, a lobbyist? Well, I'd start with saying that we're all lobbyists. Every time we ask our government for something, we're lobbying them. So we all have a role in lobbying, um, but we don't all have the, the time to do that. And so that's why you have people like me who are professional lobbyists. Um, we, we represent everybody. In fact, if you're a member of anything, if your kids go to school, if you go to a church or a, a, a congregation somewhere or the YMCA, you actually have a lobbyist. All of those organizations have someone that that is is paid to lobby for them, and um, much like lawyers, I would say ten percent of us probably earned the reputation that lobbyists have. 
But 90% of people who do what I do, do it because they believe in the mission of the organization they represent. And we all understand that elected officials are just like us. They put their pants on the same way we do, one leg at a time. Um, they they get sick as well. They drive cars. You know, they're just like us. And they don't, they don't know everything because nobody knows everything. So it's our job to make sure when they make a decision about your life, that they're fully informed about the, the consequences of that decision. And what would you be if you weren't a lobbyist? Oh, if I wasn't a lobbyist, I would probably be, I would think some sort of sports lawyer. Sports lawyer, wow. Yeah. I started law school um, wanting to be either an agent or an agent for either sports or music. Um, I had a really bad professor that ruined that for me for a while, but um, I probably would be some sort of agent. Nice. Really yeah. cool. And um, do you have any role models in your life? I have a lot of role models in my life. Um, I, I think from a government perspective, some of our um, earlier, not earlier, some of our late 20th century presidents, I, I would say, their ability to negotiate a deal bipartisan is a role model, is a role for us to follow. Um, I, I think, you know, I could name every philosopher in the world. Um, I think my faith is a role model for me. So that's where I, I tend to land. That's, that's cool. And what was the most momentous thing in your career that you're proud of? that's a good question i think a lot of people in my role would would point to specific legislation they had passed um and i've got a couple of bills that i feel like were mine that got passed and, and so i don't know that i have necessarily one momentous occasion um but i, I think every time a bill passes that i worked on it it really does feel like you know, this is, this is a, what I'm supposed to do kind of moment. Nice. And what about your failures? Do you have any failure, which either you would like to share or what did you learn from it? I have a ton of failures and, and we call them learning opportunities. Um, yeah, I think, um, probably it was a consistent failure until I decided to learn from it is trying to do everything on my own. You know, a lot of lobbyists feel like in order to prove our value, we have to own something ourselves. But really, the most successful efforts that I've ever been a part of, I was a part of them. Um, and, and I did it through collaboration and, and coordination. I think I think the learning opportunity there is you don't want to be alone in this world. Um, and you do want allies, even if they're opponents on one issue, they may be allies on the next. How would you define success? I, I don't define success. My client does. So, um, you know, I define success by delivering and exceeding on their expectations. Okay. That's a short and sweet answer. And what is the hardest part of your job? I think it's the repetitiveness of it. Um, human beings are not wired to... Um, accept information the first time it's given to them. In fact, I think a lot of people would tell you when, when I used to consult for campaigns, the campaign consultants would say, you know, the public has to hear it seven times uh, before they process what you're saying. And, and we tell campaign interns just at the moment when you're ready to vomit because you've heard it so much, the public is just starting to absorb it. And so I think the thing I struggle with the most is, is the need to repeat often everything okay so that let's jump a little bit into your past um can you tell us a little bit about your childhood where did you grow up how was your high school like yeah i grew up in rural new mexico uh, my parents uh got there because their parents were in the oil business and if you know anything about west texas and new mexico it, it was oil country 
So they they landed in rural New Mexico, and um, they were not oil people; they were teachers. And we ended up staying there. Um, not sure why we stayed, but we stayed. Um, and so it was a town of about thirty thousand people in the middle of the desert, and there wasn't a whole lot to do. And this was before the internet, so we got to rely on the three main cable stations or broadcast stations, and uh, and really just had to spend a lot of time dreaming. Um, high school we were privileged enough because of the oil economy that we had a, a really good high school faculty I, I would say that um i don't know many people who grew up in the desert who were fluent in french when they graduated from high school but i had a french teacher that was fantastic and so i, I was fluent in french and i really had a desire at that point to get out of new mexico and travel so but back to my earlier comment um my civics teacher social studies what we called it back then my social studies teachers were really good. And I, I left high school knowing the value of, of being active with our government and also what the government did and the, and the role that they were supposed to play in our lives. Hmm. And, and was that um, the key moment where you felt um, you would be a government relations specialist back then, or was there any, when was, did that pique your interest in politics or what, what happened then? Not really. Actually, I wanted to be an international business person. So I went to college, got an international business degree, uh, traveled, did a couple of uh, short internships overseas, and then decided I wanted to be a sports lawyer and a business lawyer. And so I got into law school um, and went to law school with that in mind. Um, it wasn't until my second year of law school that I interned with a member of Congress. And this was right after um, George Bush had been elected president and right after 9-11. And uh, there was Congresswoman Granger and she was really active with President Bush. He was from 30 minutes away from our place. And so, um, that really got me exposed to politics. And right about the same time um, that that all happened, you'll remember campaign finance reform, the McCain-Feingold Act went into effect. And, and I quickly became an expert on that because nobody else wanted to become an expert on that. And so I spent a couple of years advising campaigns on campaign finance law. So that's really where I got my feet wet in, in politics. Um, and then when I moved here, I got a job at the General Assembly and worked there for a few years. Um, and then, I, but I never at any any point in time, in fact, one of my internships was a lobbying firm and, and I swore off lobbying at that point. Uh, I said, I'd never do it again. And here I am. And, and um, so how did you get that first internship with, with the congressman? She was, um, she was an alumni of the school that I went to. And I really, um, I really, was fascinated by the the work of the congressional district office and they had a posting for um, an externship so i applied and got it interesting so after you graduated from law what was your first job my first job after law school was as a as one of the directors of a large uh, county party in texas county republican party in texas and i did that um for about nine months and uh, worked to get them ready for one of the big statewide elections. Um, at the same time, I was interviewing for a job with George W. Bush's White House, and I was already looking to move. And then at, also at the same time, I had proposed to now, my now wife, and she lived in Cary and had a law practice in Cary. And so we we had a lot of decisions to make. but. Um, we decided to move to North Carolina. It's the best decision I've ever made. I would say that would probably be the pivotal moment in my life is smart enough to move here and marry her. Um, but shortly after I moved here, I got the job at the General Assembly. Okay. And and can you tell us, you know, how did you get that job at the General Assembly and what piqued your interest in that? I, I did about a four-month stint um, with a now defunct think tank. And one of the... Um, in fact, my supervisor there put me in touch with Senator Berger, who's now the president pro tem. And um, I interviewed with him. He was still the minority leader at the time. 
and she recommended me to him and I interviewed and got a job with him. I see. And um, so looking back, so you got an international business administration degree. Do you think that that's helpful right now in your career? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that it's not helpful because with anything you do, there is a level of management. So right now, I, you know, I'm the, the senior vice president of advocacy at NCHA, but I, in that I do quite a bit of business work managing the association and, and making sure that we're delivering as much value as we can to our members, much like a, a business would be delivering value to their customers. Um, I also, because I work in a business setting as a lobbyist, um, I, I, I can speak the language a little bit more, but from the international perspective, I don't really, um, I don't really see myself using the international component and I haven't spoken French in 10 years. So, okay. And what about the law degree? Uh, very helpful. So I think, I, I think that it, it's a testament that you can actually go to law school and get a really good job out of law school and not actually practice law. Mm. So, you know, I don't go to courtrooms. Um, I keep my law license. I am the deputy general counsel. So I, I practice there, but, um, going to law school really helped become a government affairs specialist because it teaches you the art of negotiation. Uh, we do a lot of legislative reading. So being able to read a, a statute and a corresponding bill and make sense of them is important. We also um, negotiate between our clients and the general assembly. And, and right, those are skills that I picked up in law school. And I also think that law school helps really drive the focus on the client and what's best for your client and being able to put aside your own personal um, ambitions to make sure your clients are first and foremost. Hmm. And what was your role at the General Assembly? I think I wore a lot of hats. So in the minority, I, I worked for the, the minority caucus, um, really legal advising. Um, back then, central staff spent a lot of time with the majority. And so I, I kind of was the the legal advisor to the caucus. Um, I also did some bill drafting and, and did some reporting and made sure that everybody knew what was going on. I would meet with them to explain legislation and all that. When the Republicans took the supermajority, I then went to become budget council. Um, Republicans hadn't written a state budget in a hundred and something years. And so we had to figure that out really quick. So I became budget counsel and, and helped the Senate uh, majority write their first budget, which we got done in record time. And it was a really good budget. Then moved from there to the deputy chief of staff for policy. So I helped um, the president pro tem uh, really get his policy objectives through the general assembly at the time. Uh, and that involved coming up with policy, leading a policy team and, and uh, moving that policy through the caucus before it went to the floor. And um, your exposure to be working at the General Assembly, do you think that's helpful? Like what kind of skills did you gain from that exposure? Well, you have to have relationships um, and you have to make sure that you, you have a good rapport with everyone on both sides of the aisle and both sides of the chamber. Um, I, I spent a lot of time negotiating with my counterpart on the House side. Um, and so you, you have to have those skills. I think it also, um, it exposes you to the other side of lobbying. So I'd say any good lobbyist is someone who has been lobbied before. Um, and, and you know quickly what it is to be effectively lobbied and what an ineffective lobbyist is. And so it helps you really when you flip to the other side, much like a, uh, a, a, a the defense or public defender is a really good prosecutor and vice versa, because you know what the other side is thinking. Yeah, that's a good analogy. So after you were the policy director at the NCGA, uh, you moved on to be working as the senior vice president of advocacy at NCHA for almost a decade. Please talk us through your experience there and what does the association do? Yeah. So I was there for a little over a decade, actually. Um, and uh, my experience was really good. Uh, NCHA is the organization that represents hospitals and health systems in the state. Um, and, and they do so in, in a lot of ways, but primarily they're uh, the advocacy organization uh, for hospitals and health systems. Um, and they 
they do some really good work uh, representing them at the General Assembly and in Congress um, and work to guide them on those common principles. As you know, hospitals and health systems are independent of each other. Um, they are competitors, but they do have shared priorities. And the goal of NCHA is to take those shared priorities and advocate for them uh, before those decision makers. And can you tell us um, what kind of work were you doing at there at the NCHA? Yeah, I was. So I was lobbyist. Uh, I did the at, toward the end. I did the general counsel work. So I I did some legal advice for them. And I worked on developing those policies. So as you identify those shared priorities, you then also have to identify the shared solutions or the shared goals. And so I worked with our hospitals and with an internal team to distill those into actionable policy items. Mm -hmm. And where, how did you progress? I mean, you were there for about almost a decade or more than that. So did you start off at a position and then you worked your way up to be the That's a person? good question. Yeah, that's a good question. So NCHA recruited me from the General Assembly. I came in as the vice president and deputy general counsel. And then as retirements happened and, and as people moved on, I slowly climbed the ladder um, to, to lead the advocacy team and, and the policy team, and the communications teams. Um, and so that's where I ended. It, it's been about five years, four or five years that I have kind of been at that role. Got it. And if you would like to highlight any specific policies you worked on, just to, as an example, that would be nice. Well, I think the, 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 probably the most prescient is Medicaid expansion and the healthcare access and stabilization program, which are the two programs that NCHA, um, identified as the priority for the rest of the almost to be over legislative session. Um, and those, um, I think, are, are especially the healthcare access and stabilization program are really uh, important programs that, um, that will make sure our health systems have the resources they need to weather the storms. And do you guys work um, with the federal uh, government at all? Or is it we did. more state? Okay. Yeah, we did. So I was in charge of the federal lobbying. We had a really good uh, federal consultant who was on the ground in D.C., um, but we did work with the American Hospital Association a lot and, and with our members on federal issues. Mm. And after NCHA, um, you moved on and you're now the principal at Cody Han LLC. Can you tell us <laughs> what, what the organization is all about and what are your dreams and aspirations with it? That's a good question. So yeah, I uh, recently made the move. I uh, wanted to expand my scope and really look at um, how to how to serve clients in different arenas and in different areas. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's a real original name, Cody Hand LLC, um, but really it's just Cody Hand. Um, and uh, my goal is twofold. Um, NCHA was really great about uh, providing a lot of opportunities to be present with my family. And so I want to continue that. Um, but what I also want to do is also expand my experiences beyond just healthcare. Um, so my background actually wasn't healthcare. I started law school as a sports lawyer, uh, trying to get into sports and entertainment management. And then life just took me in a political route and a healthcare route. Um, but I'm looking to get, um, get my business bearings back and uh, see how I can help clients in ways beyond just lobbying. Obviously, I'm going to keep lobbying because um, I'm good at it, but I I want to look at other things and other options as well. I think what I would say, uh, Deepak, is my dream is, um, is to have a, a smaller book of business, smaller client mix that I can devote um, really solid attention to and make sure that their needs are being met. And if you look at my website, which ironically is codyhand.com. Uh, I was surprised it was available, but it was. Um, if you look at that, you, you see the first thing is we don't dance around the box, we blow it up. Uh, most people who know me know that I, I don't take a, a gentle approach, which uh, some people don't like. Um, but, you know, I, I'm known for being authentic. I'm known for speaking my mind and I wanna do that for my clients. And I, I think, you know, again, my dream is to have a small book of business where we we aren't necessarily being conventional in our approaches. And that's not just in advocacy. That's in strategic planning. That's in employment. That is in team development and 
taking the organization from good to great. How do we do that? And, um, and how do we do it successfully and with integrity? And um, do you plan to provide your services within North Carolina? Or do you plan to hire like, you know, you know, even, you know, get clients from other states or what is your plan? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I'm in North Carolina. I'm based here uh, and I, I love North Carolina. And so I'm, I'm looking to stay local and provide my services to North Carolina entities. But as you know, we don't, our state lines don't, um, they're not walls. And so I have really good connections in other states, many other states. I'm actually now working on my law license for New York um, to get that in place. And I'm, I, I'm on the last step of getting that done. Um, continue to work in Washington. We've got really good connections in Washington, D.C., not just with our delegation in North Carolina, but with other states. And so, you know, while I want to stay in Raleigh and focus on Raleigh, I also want to focus on what I can provide for the client that may not be North Carolina specific. Mm. And do you plan to be in the lobbying world moving forward? I, I do. In fact, so I'm looking at, at four buckets, uh, Deepak. One is obviously practicing law. Um, a lot of organizations need a general counsel, but don't have the budget for full time. And so uh, that's a niche that I'm looking to fill. Uh, the second bucket is strategic planning. Um, I, you know, bring those outside eyes and ears into your organization to get your strategic plan either done, started or, or refined is, is good. Uh, the third bucket would be advocacy. Again, I've got uh, a big Rolodex um, full of contacts and I want to make sure that I don't waste the past almost 20 years of my life. Um, and I do enjoy lobbying. I enjoy um, my style, which is relationship building. And I, I, I like the people that I like. And so, and I like a lot of people and I want to maximize those. And then that fourth bucket that we alluded to earlier is that, that management side, sports management, entertainment management. So um, I can see three of the three buckets that aren't advocacy actually feeding into the advocacy work because at any given time uh, you need somebody to to represent you at the general assembly or before congress um just depending on what laws are being proposed or what issues you need addressed hmm. that's that's quite interesting and and I, I feel like you probably fit the bill for all the four categories and um moving forward um what how do you see yourself in the next you know five ten years down the line well, so I've got a 13-year-old and an 8-year-old, and, and you know, I, I know you're asking five to 10 years professionally, but I, I can't uh, not talk about the the desire that I have to make sure that I'm a present father. And so five to 10 years, you know, I've got one going into college and one finishing high school. Um, my ultimate desire is to make sure that I'm present for them and providing for them. Um, I can't do that without having a really solid book of business. So for the next five to 10 years, I'm really going to be working on establishing myself as an independent operator and making sure that I have a reputation among my clients that I really don't have to spend a lot of money advertising, right? That, that my business is built by word of mouth. Um, I don't necessarily want to build an empire. Um, I don't need that. Uh, but what I want to do is leverage my talents and my skills and my relationships for my clients so that they meet their objectives and I meet mine at the same time. Perfect. And any in closing remarks, any word of advice or anything which you would like to share from the wisdom you've gathered? Uh, yeah. So the first and foremost is your, your uh, word is your bond, um, especially in lobbying. Uh, you're known by your integrity um, it's a small, tight-knit circle of people, and we we know each other, and we know who to trust, we know who not to trust. And legislators and members of Congress are human, and you have to develop trust and a relationship with them as well. And you can't do that if you're not being honest. So number one, you've just got to be honest. Number two, don't be an island. You know, we are all not necessarily competitors, um, but we all need clients. We all need business. But at the same time, you get much more done working together than you do trying to operate on your own. Excellent. That's a great way to end this beautiful conversation. <laughs> it, it has been an honor to have you on the show. Thanks so much, Cody. All right. Thank you.